I guess so, yeah. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Dr. Deborah Harris O'Brien. I'm the Eastern Psychi Vice President. And um, I'm very, very pleased to bring you this symposium today. Um, I know that this is a topic that is very important to students. I know it's important to my students at uh, Trinity Washington, where I teach. Um, so I'd like to introduce to you our panel. And um, I will, fingers crossed, uh, we have some handouts for you. And they got held up by the weather. They're supposed to be delivered by 1 o'clock. So um, before we finish up here, I hope I will have handouts for you. Um, but I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. We we'll start with um, Dr. Ron Shapiro, uh, who is uh, the candy man. <laughs> Watch uh, out for this guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Paul Hedich and uh, Dr. David Ernst. And uh, <coughs> they are quite the experts on this topic. Um, they're going to do a more formal presentation. After that is over, we have this room. Psychi has the room for the whole day. Yes. So um, at 1.30, I'm not sure where they're going to put it, but um, the hotel is bringing in refreshments. So I hope we can stay for that. Uh, and um, very graciously, uh, Dr. Shapiro, Dr. Hedich, and Dr. Ernest have agreed to stay and do some informal conversations with students. If you have specific questions uh, about your situation, they are here to help you. So um, on behalf of Psychi, thank you so very much for being with us today. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm the lead-off person, and I've asked mm -hmm. Professor Ernest here to, uh, and i got to watch out for the <coughs> to uh, give me a signal at 13 minutes so that I know I finish at 15, and I would leave about five minutes for a question and answer at that point, okay, before we continue with Dr. Shapiro. My name is Paul Hedick. I'm a professor emeritus at DePaul University. I've been interested in college-to-workplace issues since the 90s or so when my Alumni would come back and say, gee, we had a wonderful liberal arts education. We had a wonderful psych major. They had to say that. Uh, but I ha I've had difficulties uh, getting into the job market. I've had trouble working. And at the same time, I was hearing executives say, you know, these college graduates are bright, but they, they just don't adapt well to the workplace. And that began my interest in an area. And unfortunately, it's not been an area that psychology has investigated very much. Uh, I also write for the, I write the column, uh, Wisdom from the Workplace for Psy and Psychi. Does anybody read that? Be honest, say no. Uh, I will give you a copy, I may not have enough, of the various articles that I have written, if you can pass this around, dealing with, uh, dealing with career-related issues. And one of them suggests that if you want to do research, why not choose the topic of, of uh, college to workplace issues. There's a whole number of areas from industrial organizational to uh, emerging adulthood, a number of concepts. If you actually want a research project, why not study your own transition? That's what I'm saying. In any case, uh, let's get started. Uh, this is the abstract which we showed you earlier. A typical graduate enters the job market with about $25,000 in debt. You can expect that about half the jobs out there don't require a college degree, which is a complicated issue. And, uh, and employers, for the most part, are going to be very skeptical about you. This is mostly at the baccalaureate level, but some of you going on to the master will encounter the same thing. By the way, how many of you are undergraduates? I would imagine most of you. Do we have any teachers in here? OK. The, the young teachers I have difficulty distinguishing from students. It's part of getting old. Uh, now, how many of you work full time? Okay, I didn't wasn't counting you guys, but uh, how many of you have part time jobs of say roughly 20 hours or more? Okay, how many of you have not had any part time work or have had minimal or part time job experience? Okay, you guys, you, you need work experience whether you need the money or not. Get yourself diverse work experiences. Employers are going to be looking for that. Okay, we call this college to workplace when your great expectations confront reality. And you do have great expectations. You've devoted the last four or five years in college, tremendous time resources, 
the financial resources, your family are depending on you, so you go out in the working place and say, hi, I'm a college graduate, you know. Where's the $50,000 a year executive job, okay? And unless you're in engineering uh, or nursing or accounting, don't expect to get the job that's in your career right away. What you're going to have to do is adjust your expectations. You are a freshman again. And I know the word freshman has some negative connotations, but I'm using it intentionally because you are a freshman again when you go to the workplace in spite of your achievements, your high GPA and everything else. Uh, let's back up a little bit. You're going to be in a new, brand new institution. The culture is going to be different. The, uh, you're going to be working with people of greater diverse ages. You're going to have a different body of knowledge to master. New responsibilities, new tasks. It's not going to seem anything like your psychology classes. Uh, you work with age diverse uh, peers, uh, and there'll be generational tensions because the general attitude in the workplace of people over 50 is that you, that, that you are uh, you know, millennials and you don't have a work ethic and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, that may be true for some, but not another, and we can quarrel over the research. Uh, you're going to be at the bottom of the hierarchy for the most part. Uh, but you're going to be expected to act professionally at all times, regardless if you have the most humiliating job, you're still going to be expected to act like a professional. You're not going to enjoy reading a psychology. Gone are the days when you can compare this theory with that theory. You're going to have to apply it, and that's going to be difficult, because for the most part, we academics don't get into applications as the central issue. And again, the employers may complain. Now, uh, Philip Gardner uh, is a psychologist. He's the director of the uh, Collegiate Employment Research Institute of Michigan State University. They do a tremendous amount of research on college to workplace issues. Your references have this website. He does a lot of studies that would be of importance to you. And he goes around each year uh, with his, uh, well, he, he has a, uh, a, a annual report on the job market. And this is what he concluded in 2012. I'll let you read it. Not terribly optimistic, is he? <laughs> the consistent and damning, and damning rhetoric from employers that the student sense of entitlement, you've heard that before, expectations and level of preparedness is totally out of sync with the reality of the workplace. That sounds harsh. It's getting a little less harsh because students are learning uh, about this and some employers are making some adjustments. However, there is a positive side and most employers will tell you that sooner or later, uh, you do learn to adapt. It may take you two, three, four years, maybe two or three jobs, but sooner or later you break into things. Uh, by the time young people are at the end of their 20s, uh, they have a comfortable feeling about where they're going, what they want to do. Many will start going to graduate school full-time or part-time, but this is the reality of, of the workplace. Most of all, it's an exciting time in your life. You're going to have the fun of going out, being on your own, being independent as much as you can, although probably a third to a half you may find yourself living with mom and dad uh, who support you in one way or the other. But it is an exciting time, and when I look back in my 20s as I went from uh, military to graduate school and so on, it was an exciting time. I, I wouldn't want to relive it, but it was a great time. <laughs> I never want to go back to the past. Now, one of the things you're going to encounter is that you're going to find a difference between the cultures of the college and the cultures of the organization. This particular study is, is from a nice, neat little compact careers book by Ed Holton and Sharon Nakeen from Louisiana State University. It was based on a 1998 study. It's old, but it's still useful. I haven't found anything better. If you're looking for a senior project, uh, a survey survey a bunch of college graduates one, two, five years out and find out what the differences are. Most of these are general, most of them are appropriate. My colleague here is going to argue with a couple of my points, but that's good because not all work settings are exactly the same. You're, you're going to find yourself in a setting where instead of getting feedback on your exam, teachers writing comments on it, you might not get any feedback, but maybe a couple of times a year uh, in the form of uh, uh, evaluations. Uh, Many employers now recognizing young people's need for concrete feedback are doing a little bit better job of it, but don't expect it to be at the level that you've got in your senior level courses. You go from a highly structured curriculum to one where there is no syllabus in the workplace, okay? You're not going to come in on Tuesday and say, I'm supposed to read this, I'm supposed to do that. 
your supervisor will have given you something to do, and he or she will say, do it, uh, and with little or no, with little or no structure in it. That's hard to get used to. Uh, a number of, uh, you know, a number of changes now. Uh, Ron is going to argue that there's maybe more personal support. Again, it's going to vary from environment to environment. But don't expect a lot of personal support in many situations you're in. Uh, schedules go from flexible to structured. Uh, you're not going to be able to take long breaks at Christmas. Uh, no, no spring day breaks down in Cancun or Florida or wherever. Uh, and a number of other things. Uh, another point that's interesting, you won't have the joy of reading textbooks and comparing theorists and criticizing things. Your challenge is going to be very much, how do I do this job? How do I get along with the people that I'm working with? And that will be a challenge for some individuals. The other part of this survey gets into this area, performance, your choice. In college, you can say, I'm going to work for an A in this course. I'll be content with a B there. In this course, is a general ed requirement. I just get a C. Most employers are going to expect you to do a good job all the time. Again, Ron may have some exceptions for that. I think the main point you have to consider is the focus. In college, you are working for yourself. College is about you, OK? And while you may encounter some <coughs> team requirements, group experiments, for the most part, you are on your own working for and about you. And if we live in a narcissistic world, as I think we do, the temptation has become even more involved. In the workplace, you're, you're going to work for the organization. You're going to get you have to results. Look at it this way. Your job, in the most crass way, is to make your boss look good. OK? Ron is nodding to that. Your job is to make the boss look good, which means you kind of put yourself off to the side. Not that you can't develop. There are opportunities for personal development and so on. And so these are, are some of the differences. Uh, most of the surveys I read say the team skills are very, very important. And hopefully your teachers are giving you group team experiences. Don't assume that right away that's all you need because there's a big difference between a four-week assignment in a classroom and six months on, on a job. Answers right, few right, a lot of ambiguity. Uh, ambiguity is going to be your best friend. You'll never quite know from day to day how to deal with the uncertainties. It makes you nervous, but, but on the other hand, it's, it's good experience. So, you can sit in the back of a classroom, which I'm sure you don't, you wouldn't be here, but you can sit in the back of the classroom for four years and get a C, okay? After all, C's get degrees. <laughs> that I heard from Eric Lander, by the way, I can't, I can't take credit for that. Uh, but when you go to the workplace, especially if it's a job that's actually going to make use of your background, it's going to be lots of initiative required. So if you're shy, and there are some people legitimately shy, or if you're apathetic, and some people you know, are just apathetic, you're going to have to change your way of, of thinking on that. So these are differences in the culture, the organizational culture. We don't think about that. Let me suggest this. When you go to work, part-time job, no matter how sophisticated or how dull it is, take this with you. Ask yourself, what kind of a culture am I working in, even if it's only 10 or 20 hours a week? How do I react to this culture? What things can I adjust too easily? What things don't I like? Use this information. Now, uh, two things here. Uh, this is a report that came out by AACU, which is the Association of American Colleges and Universities. Uh, conducted by Heart Research Associates. This came out in January. I worked with a few of their uh, graphs and got permission to, they were very happy to give me permission to do this. And what they did is they divided skills into three categories in terms of what were important. I'm going to show you two of them. And let's work on the skills first of all. Uh, notice, notice that these are the skills that 80 to 85 percent of the employers thought were very important. Notice what they are. Communication skills. If your teachers uh, seem like they're demanding too much of you in terms of formal presentations, if they're evaluating you in your formal presentations, if they're marking up your reports, and if they're forcing you to learn APA style, be grateful that they are teaching you communication skills. Because as we see, uh, and I shouldn't be getting over to this part yet, what you think you have uh, your, your perception of readiness versus the employer's perception of readiness is way off. So 
oral communication, written communication, uh, working in teams, uh, ethical issues, critical thinking. By the way, if you went down the list of the new APA guidelines for the curriculum, these would be among the goals. Rest assured that the goals of the curriculum that APA has set out match the skills that employers in general uh, believe are valuable. Your teachers are teaching you workplace skills. Chances are what they're not doing is they're not telling you in class about these skills often enough. I advise teachers that when you give an assignment, when you give a group research assignment, tell them you know, these are the skills that you're practicing, these are the skills that you'll need in the workplace. When you get to the, when you go to go to interview for jobs, no one's going to ask you, do you prefer a cognitive theory to an existential theory of personality? No. They want to know, what skills did you learn? What is the evidence of those skills? And how can you apply them? They're not going to care about majors. Employers in general, when they look at liberal arts graduates, they don't care what you majored in so much as what skills did you get, what, how, what's the evidence, and so on. And psychology does a very, very good job of identifying and teaching skills. He gave me the, the two-minute warning. These are the skills that 56 to 70 percent of the employers thought very important. Again, these are very important. Problem solving, organizing information, staying current on technologies. They want you to be computer sophisticated, technology sophisticated, and that doesn't mean you're, you can text faster than you did last year, okay? That doesn't, that doesn't count. Working with people from different backgrounds is important, and Professor Ernest over here is going to focus on that particular topic. What can you do? Use your job experiences to identify the transferable skills. I don't care what kind of job you did, and I had a lot of humble ones myself. You are in a situation where you are building some skills. Pay attention to those skills. Take those skill sheets with you, and uh, you will be able to uh, you'll be able to see some connection. Look for collaborative opportunities, okay? Take other courses. I know some teachers wince if I say, gee, you should take a course in economics or marketing, management. Basically, marketing and management courses have a lot of psychology built in them, okay? Don't go into the workplace ignorant of basic business concepts. Consider a minor in business. He might suggest consider a double major in business. I mean, psychology is your liberal arts major, You've got to take courses in other areas that prepare you for specific careers. Extracurricular activities are very <laughs> important, so are volunteer activities, because they teach you leadership skills, which is important. They teach you interpersonal skills. Join the college uh, clubs. Get in arguments with the president if you don't like what's going on. Learn to deal with conflict, manage conflict. Develop those interpersonal skills. I've had people say those interpersonal skills in some ways are more important than the academic skills. So if you don't have interpersonal skills, that's where that becomes absolutely important. Uh, they also teach you self-efficacy, a sense of self. Work with your counseling center. Go to your career counselors. Have them work with you because, remember, your teachers are not specialists in these baccalaureate jobs. Teachers are specialists in graduate school specialties. So deal, deal with the, uh, work with the uh, counseling center uh, across a number of areas. And by the way, we all know that uh, this, these generations of college, graduate, college students are bringing in an increased number of personal problems. You live in a highly complex society. I'm glad I'm not a teenager nowadays. Uh, life was more simple, but you, there are a lot, young people have a lot more problems, I think, than they did years ago. Deal with them now, okay? You go into the workplace, the stress is going to add to them. You go into the workplace and you'll discover you'll have to pay for your counseling on weekends at 125 an hour. Right now your you're, right counseling uh, is part of your tuition. So work with the counseling center on all these issues. Employers want to see an e-portfolio. Most of all, construct meaning in your life. Look at the big picture. Yes, you're looking for a job, and you might have to take any job, okay, to start out with. Be patient, give yourself credit, then look to develop a career. And as you're developing a career, look for the real big picture. Look for a calling in your life. When you're in your 30s, 40s, and 50s, you can say, okay, this is who I am, this is what I'm good at, and, and look for a calling, not just a job. I got to back up 
because, and I know I'm running out of time, what I didn't emphasize is the tremendous difference, the discrepancy. You know, life is like a giant chi-square. You're constantly comparing what you observe with what you expect. Okay? <laughs> Students expect they've got great communication skills, but this is the view of employers. And the report didn't say why such great discrepancies. I'm not surprised, uh, except that they're much greater than I thought. And about the only place where you guys came close to the employer is staying current on technology. But, but this is a real issue. Don't expect college to, college liberal arts is not designed to put you right into the workplace, okay? Liberal arts is different from training, but liberal arts gives you a, a vast variety of very important skills. I read reports that say how important these general skills are. Don't let anybody tell you you can't get a job with a bachelor's degree. Don't let anybody tell you that your liberal arts education is not good. It is good, but you may not recognize that in the first two or three jobs you take. And I'm past my 15 minutes, so I have a few minutes for questions. I'm sorry to rush through this. I could go on all day, but what, what are your thoughts about what I have said here? I, I don't know if any of you are shocked, saddened, or you aware of it or what? I was really surprised at the gap between the perception of right students and employers. I didn't think it would be so well for employers. So, so such a great gap? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and we might want to discuss this, you know, later on. I'm not sure in the report didn't say why, but recognize that if, maybe if they're even 10% off or 20% off, they don't think you're as good as you think you are. <laughs> That's what it boils down to. But uh, with self-efficacy, self-confidence, persistence, and a good work ethic, you can show them that that's not the case. And employers are recognizing nowadays that uh, we've got a bright new class. They, they, they do respect people with a good work ethic, with talent, technical savvy, and so on. So many of them are working towards trying to understand you, okay? I, I know of organizations that make changes just to, uh, just to accommodate uh, some of the pre preferences of the millennials, but there are these gaps. Yeah, I'm surprised too, and I could go on with hypotheses about them, but but uh, that's all they would be. Other thoughts or questions? Yes. Um, I just thought it was interesting how you brought up the idea of that we're kind of going out there being overly confident, and I mean, it made me wonder if maybe like our society, our environment on a college campus, if some professors are more comforting than others. Like they, it's like you have like the like the kind of not playing you up in a sense, but kind of playing you up. Kind of, I don't know. But um, also it made me wonder if maybe the idea of confidence is like internally, like there's the fear of like, if maybe like you go out there, you don't have the confidence that you won't get something. Right? Well, there's a lot to be said. Gene Twenge has written about the millennials uh, and uh, the, 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 which was the word uh, uh, that she used, the, the overconfidence, because you've grown up in the age of self-esteem, you've been told you can do anything you want, blah, 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 blah. And she's brought some good points which are arguable. But you also make a, a, a good point, too. I once uh, contacted a student who, uh, who was out working in a human resources environment, and she had been our departmental assistant. Bright, young, hardworking gal, a good GPA, and I talked to her, and I said, how, how was it adjusting to the workplace? And uh, she said, I, I, uh, I found myself too sensitive to the criticism. And I didn't tell her this, but I wish I would have. I would have said, Jenny, when you worked for us, you did everything right. I didn't need to criticize you for anything. But uh, I wish I had said that to her. But as I look back, yeah, we had some very good student assistants working for us. Yes, you would say, you know, you need to do this or that. But she was in a workplace where she went in with a high GPA, high confidence, high level of maturity, and had some supervisors who were very direct in saying, this isn't good enough. And she took it personally. Uh, and this evidently happened a number of times. So, yes, that's why part-time jobs are important. That's why getting into extracurricular activities or throw yourself out in a situation where you can be criticized. And best with, in a college environment, which is very supportive, uh, that's why extracurriculars are good. I can remember my involvement in college organizations, one of which I helped start, and then we had to, uh, we had to dissolve it because the treasurer went up, ran off with the money during the summertime. Uh, and I remember the hard knocks we kind of took along the way, and I'm glad I learned those skills in a college environment 
rather than in a workplace where I might have been fired or strongly disciplined or whatever. So take risks to trying new things that ultimately will be valuable for you. Take the risks in college because you're in a much more supportive environment. Final question, we're probably ready to go on. We're ready to go on. David's last. He knows that we've got to go on. So, so thank you. We'll be around to answer more questions. When you're doing a program like this, always tell the last person of the timekeeper. See, if he's too nice to me, he doesn't get to speak, right? Yep. Yes. But, yeah. you know, that's the way that works. And he gave me some extra time. So. And Paul did a great job. Uh, do we have a slide advancer? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, there we go. The button up with the arrow to the right. Right. Paul did a great job of giving you some personal advice and some professional advice. Follow. Some of his data I will argue with and would argue with in the next hour, but his own conclusions I completely agree with. Now, Paul said $50,000 a year job. Why would you want one of those? I want to get you 70. You can do it. Yeah, and if you're listening carefully, Paul even told you how. What did you say, Paul? Get an engineering degree. That's right. Engineering, an engineering psychology degree. There is such a thing. Human factors, ergonomics, engineering site. Anyone not hear of it before? Okay. Well, we'll talk about that. Stay the next hour. We'll talk about getting into a master's program, if you like, or a PhD program, where you can expect a minimum of 70K to start. Why bother for 50K or 30K? I don't, I don't quite get it. I'm well, trying to be realistic. I am being realistic. <laughs> okay. Come out and join us in the engineering psych part, IO psych, another area that pays well that you need to be thinking about. Now, let's get started here. I want to be the optimist today. Paul gave you somewhat of a pessimistic day. Now I'm going to turn it the other way. Paul was absolutely right about his 50%, right? Half the people get jobs outside the field, but it doesn't even have to be one of you. Not even one of you. Keep this in mind. The psychology degree gives you lots of freedom freedom to make lots of mistakes. If you were majoring in chemical engineering, how many electives would you have in college? Maybe one a semester at best, maybe one a year. They tell you everything. You go, you take your technical education, you graduate, you're a chemical engineer, very similar to all the other chemical engineers. Probably too structured. Now come to us, we're probably too much the other direction, too unstructured. We say you need to have, what, so many courses from this part of psych, so many from that part, and so many from a third part. You could probably, at most colleges, get away with taking all lecture courses, no class that wasn't in an auditorium, et cetera. No class where you actually met a faculty member. And maybe even no class that where you actually had a faculty member. True? You could do that, right? Those are the people that won't get the jobs in like You can. Now, why do I say that? And oh, and if you do end up in one of those, you'll probably advance quickly. Let me tell you about Karen. I worked for Karen. Karen was a vice president of human resources for a Fortune 500 company. One day, Karen said to me, Ron, for all the good it did to me, for me, I was a psych major, and I got hired as a secretary. I said, Karen, what are you today? Vice president of human resources. I said, Karen, do you think your psych degree helped you to advance? Oh, yeah, I never thought of that before. So two major things about a psych degree. A, it can help you get a good job if you do it right, and B, even if it doesn't help you get that great job to begin with, it can help you grow into one very, very quickly. Well, first of all, you're a psych huh? Now, Paul said he was going to argue with me, and that's all I'll argue with myself instead. His argument was, well, if you just join psych high and you pay you whatever the dues are. How much are the dues now? You pay you $35 or $55 a year or, or to join, and I know how you spent 35 to 55 dollars, but that's all that tells me, other than you had a good GPA. I knew that before. Now, it's what you do with that degree. By the way, if I'm interviewing, I can be brutal. I can actually state that. Well, I know how you spent 35 dollars or 55. Now, why is that on your resume? Tell me. And some people count. For those people, you draw a line right through that. But that's not any of you I know about. You're a leader. You've done something for Psychi. If I were interviewing you and I were to say, how was psych high better at your university as a result of you having been there, you will be able to answer that question. I know that. And if not, be able to answer by the time I talk to you again. <laughs> You've maximized the value of your psych degree. I know you did all of these things, and if you did, don't tell me, just correct it. You took research methods early in your academic year. You were the one pounding on your advisor's door saying, I can't take that until sophomore year, I want to take it freshman year. 
You have worked closely with faculty and research projects. You didn't wait for them to come to you. Freshman week, while everyone else was out doing whatever they did, going to bars or something like that, you were knocking on research faculty's members' doors and saying, I want to get started in your research project. How can I start tomorrow? I've read all your papers already. What's disgusting? <laughs> Actually, do it the other way around. Mention I read your papers, what's disgusting? Then I'd like to get involved with this. We know you've taken small, intensive seminars. You don't take those big classes. You, you don't even know where the auditoriums are. You have a great faculty recommendations because you've done all of the above. And here's a guideline for knowing if you'll get good faculty recommendations. What's the name of each child that your faculty member has? <laughs> That's so weird. Assuming they have kids. It's so true. <laughs> if, you have, if you know that, and there's nothing important about knowing the kids' names, but you would know them well enough because people are people. You talk about your kids when you're working or your parents or whomever. So if you know all that stuff, you're probably in good, tra uh, in good uh, shape. If you don't, you know what you need to do. Great faculty recommendations. Now, I know I have only one faculty member here, uh, but I, I, as I recall from my survey, or someone else came in. But here's a tip. Faculty members think that letters of recommendation are letters of evaluation. They are not. A letter of recommendation is a sales pitch. R message to faculty members. Do not say anything negative about a student in a recommendation for industry. You are writing a letter of recommendation. If you were buying a car at a car dealership, would the car salesman say, but this car doesn't X so well, and it doesn't have enough leg room in the back seat? Probably not, right? They're going to tell you about the great horsepower or the great space in the front seat or whatever they're going to tell you. Same with selling a student. It is their job to sell you. You are paying them to do that. They have no other responsibility other than to not lie. If they can't write an honest letter of recommendation, they should say, no thanks. I know there's waving letters, waving the wait to see letters. If I write one for you, I'm going to tell you to sign it, I'll hand you a copy of it the second you do. You should see it. They should show it to you. Uh, and you should work on it collaboratively with them. Collaboratively with them. How do you get that good one? Well, first of all, write a draft of it yourself. Think about what could this faculty member possibly say that's good about me? then put it into an outline and hand it to them. You know, you worked on this and this project, you did blah, blah, blah. They'll say it. I mean, yeah, they're human. They don't want to spend any more time in these things than they have to. If you give them all the information, they'll use it. And that's good news. And uh, from an industrial point of view, you can say you heard someone that was with a Fortune 500 company for 23 years, hired lots of people, blah, blah, blah. If I see something negative on the recommendation, I just simply tell everybody else there's something wrong with the faculty. Got it? Uh, and by the way, yes, I have had to explain some of that away. As well, you know how faculty members are. This says more about the faculty member than the student. Let's cross it out and move ahead. I went to the higher somebody. But nonetheless, sometimes that could count against you. Uh, and you have significant accomplishments to discuss. And most important, you're here. <laughs> what should you do now? As Paul mentioned, study business and technology. Maybe a dual major. You read my slides. <laughs> and maybe not a dual major, but the equivalent of a dual major. Do some meaningful internships, a few of them. Now, here's a tip. If you can't get a really good summer internship, what should you do? Get a winter internship. Study in the summer and do your internship off-season. It'll be much easier to get a good internship off-season. I know APA has referred someone to me that I'll be talking to, I think, next week if he calls, who wants a summer internship now. And you know, I hope he gets it. I'm going to try and help him. But the bad news is it's March. The best internships went in September, October. Uh, consider earning a master's degree in human factors or I.O. or a PhD, as I mentioned when I opened. Produce a resume which roars. That means it's results-oriented and relevant, as you can tell on the business card I handed you. I will make this offer to you if anyone's applying for a job. I'll review your resume, no charge. I will not work on it to improve it other than to talk with you. If you do it and you send it back to me, I'll look at it again. I'll talk to you on the phone. I don't write it. But that I will offer you. As well as if for some reason those handouts don't make it, I'll send you a copy if you write to me. Just don't write before Sunday. Network a lot. Now, when I was waiting outside this room in the previous session, as you know, ran over a little bit, Paul, David, and I were talking. There were a couple of groups of students who were talking. Most of you stood silently. That was not a smart thing to do. You could have met the person next to you. Could have shared information. Got the point? Network. 
Talk with other students. Help each other out. You won't hurt yourself if you do. Talk with the professionals. Don't be afraid to interrupt them. If they're nasty to you, don't talk to them again. But don't let that generalize to anybody else. And you don't care either if they were nasty. You only need a few people that are nice. If most of them are nasty, who cares? <laughs> Practice interviewing. Practice with anybody you can, preferably people with some industrial experience. Always carry business cards. How many of you have your business cards with you? I want to see those hands nice and high. How many of you have business cards? <laughs> One, two. Okay, next year at the conference, everybody at this, you never know. I might want to hire you. I might say, you know, you're really impressive and so forth. Always have them. Don't, and here's a key one. If you do take a job in a psychology related field, like working in a mental health facility, something like that, is we don't stay long. No more than two years. Maybe you can twist my arm to three. Maybe. Maybe. But no longer. Why not? Why shouldn't you stay more than two years if you love the job? Nicole, why shouldn't you stay more than two years? I don't feel like you're going to advance. Like, I don't feel like you're going to go any further because of the fact that you're in something that's, you know, an entry level and mostly entry level, just the... Right, right. Nicole level. has the picture exactly right. Now let's talk about it again in, in another context to hit home more powerfully because this is something people do and I think it's a mistake. You are now probably about 21 age-wise, give or take a little bit, right? Let's say you go to work for someone that's, say, 45 that you love, a psychiatrist or psychologist, right? They're great. It's 20 years from now. Guess what they are? 65. The age that many people choose to retire. retire. They are going to be replaced by you? No, you only have a bachelor's degree. Someone who's 25 with a new PhD. Congratulations. You are now 41. Your only work experience is in this one environment, and you're now working for 25 year old. You're going to like it? Probably you'll be miserable. So think, think ahead to that as well as start saving for your retirement and get an IRA. But, uh, okay, now, what are you going to do in industry? You're going to help your employer achieve their goals. That's simple. That's what you do. You help your employer achieve your goals. Making a profit and gaining market share while saving money. Now, let's say that you uh, get that 70,000 a year job, because that's what I said you could probably get. How much does your employer have to make for you to get 70K? How much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Uh, to get your 70K, how much money do they have to take out of the cash register? Roughly. 140 k Nicole, you were absolutely right on the first question. You need more experience in the industry. You couldn't be more wrong. Uh, someone have a better guess. A million? Okay, where did you come up with a million? Tell me the calculation. <laughs> okay, my hat might have been a better answer, but you actually guessed pretty close to being correct. Let's talk about it. Why is that? Well, let's say you're working in big industry for now. Triple your salary to cover stuff like benefits and immediate management costs. So Nicole was right there. So 70 becomes 210K. Okay, give or take a few dollars. Now, let's take it a little bit further. Could a company that had some sort of product to sell possibly spend all of their money on psychologists? No. What would they spend? 8% maybe? Probably less, but let's say 8%. So therefore, take your 210K and multiply it by 12, and that's one and a half million or something like that. That's what you've got to take out of the cash register. So be thinking, think big on the projects you get involved with. Don't get sidetracked into something that's not important to the employer. You obviously went off a high quality products, want to help them achieve high cu customer sad, prevent accidents and litigation, that's pretty obvious. But now, you want to help your customers achieve their goal, whoever your customers could be. It could be an internal development group, could be external customers that are paying cash for something. Whoever it is, you want to help them achieve their goals by designing things or systems to do that. You, you then have to convince others to implement the designs and measure how well the needs are met. All psychology, huh? That's why you're going to be so good. You can, if you've taken a little computer science, you can prototype the designs, do some models and stuff, you know, some math, validate them, and work with marketing to help sell them. Again, you're going to interact with all sorts of people. You're going to be representing the company. That's why, you know, Paul said represent your organizations working with lots of other people, uh, advising people, 
And I always recommend developing your skills unless you plan to retire and not do anything else. And also save for your retirement. Two big things. When you reach an age, let's say 50 something, you may want to be independent, go off on your own. If you have a few million dollars in the bank, it'll be no problem to do. If you have a few dollars in the bank, it'd be pretty hard to do. And jobs can go away. Let's say you're raised to, you rise to being a senior manager in a company, and that company goes bankrupt. What are you going to do next? Is somebody going to hire a senior manager in a company that just went bankrupt? Hmm. Are you going to be able to go back and compete with a new college grad? Probably not. For example, right now you guys are better at statistics than I am, probably. You know, just take one example. You've just taken all these courses and stuff. I haven't done a statistical analysis personally in many, many years. I've had people do it for me, et cetera. <laughs> and teaching class always helps you develop your skills. What do you need to know? Your objectives. You need to know why you're doing things. Make sense? How you measure your success, your product line. If you're going for a job interview, know the company, as Paul mentioned. Know the company. Know them well. It doesn't take that long to know more than most job candidates do. I had a guy uh, work for me, and he decided to go work somewhere else. He went for a job interview uh, for a consumer electronics company. He bought a magazine at the airport that was talking about the company and read it on the plane. They thought he was an expert. <laughs> they hired him, and he stayed with them for many, many years. Know who your customer is. Know how to engage the organization. Know how to build business cases and know how to present in 10 charts or less, including the title page. Many of the faculty members probably don't know that skill. What are you going to do? Business relevant work. Be perceived as bringing value to people. You may have to tell them what value you bring, but be perceived as doing so. Establish a board of directors. Some people say get a mentor, right? You've heard that. It's not enough. One person doesn't know enough to mentor you. Make sense? You need people from all different kinds of backgrounds. Maybe one in psychology, one in business management, maybe one in financial. Think about it. Think about yourself as a little nonprofit or a little business that needs a board of directors. Now, don't scare people by saying you want to be at my board of directors, but just think <laughs> that. Get, uh, later, you can tell them you're know, five years later, you can thank them for being at the board of directors and see what they say. Get to know your colleagues and clients well. Remember the little things. Remember those little things. Facebook and LinkedIn help you with that. Remember those. Prepare a summary of every project you're doing. Just keep it on file. Now, don't necessarily record what the project was. Report what you did. Make sense? Don't tell me about your research advisor's project and his or her findings. Tell me what you did and tell me your findings. Don't tell me about the project. Tell me about you. And Ask who was there. This tip comes from Bill Madsen, who was at the time a vice president for a Fortune 500 company, is now a vice president of HR for another Fortune 500 company. Whenever someone says they said, ask who was they, deliberately said with a grammatical error to emphasize the point, because chances are they doesn't exist. Make sense? They said, that means it's a rumor. Who's they? Let me go talk to they. Oh, well, uh, go find out for me. Never, they'll never come back. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, fund your 401k. Avoid long presentations. I guess I'm going too long. That's what I should be avoiding myself. Oh well. Highlighting problems without recommending a solution. Don't tell me I'm in trouble. Well, it's okay if you're a real junior employee. But if you want to establish yourself as a senior growth oriented employee, give me a solution. Better to highlight a problem and not, than to hide it, but better to come up with a solution. Don't be whining and negative. Uh, don't use too much time for people before you offer value. Don't waste time on unimportant things, as I said before. And uh, try and get products done. Don't be the rule maker. And uh, I thank you very much. How did I do on my time? Good. I did. Do I have time for questions? A minute. I have one minute for questions. <laughs> OK. What questions do you have? OK, I have one for you. What's the most valuable thing I said? Nicole. The most valuable thing you said is, who is they? One of the most valuable things. Though. I will send Bill Matson a note and tell him that you said so, Nicole. Thank you very much. David. Do you want us to keep time for you, too? I, I think I can keep it short. OK. Yeah, this is I'm confident. This is self-efficacy right there. <laughs> So good afternoon, guys. Uh, I'm Dr. David Ernst from Towson University, and I'm going to be talking a little differently than our last two speakers. I'm going to talk to you about a skill you may not have known you already have. Okay, when someone 
talking about going out to businesses, we're talking about the skill set that you have when you're selling yourself as a psychology student, something you may not have thought about. So we're going to talk about cultural competency, which really is in the context of diversity. Now I could ask you what is diversity, and you could give me a definition, you could tell me a little bit about it, but when you see the word diversity, when you think about it, what does it mean to you, diversity? A lot of different things. Variety. There's variety, definitely. <coughs> what else? Cultures. Culture. Differences. Differences. And similarities. Similarities. Acceptance. Acceptance. Right, it's all of those things. If you think about psychology as a field, we focus a lot on individual differences. We talk about cultural differences, societal differences. So when we talk about cultural competence, I'm of course going to tell you what that is. But first we have to talk about diversity. What is that? Now uh, when we talk about diversity, we have all kinds of definitions depending on who you're talking to, depending on if it's an APA definition, if it's IO psychology, which is my area, depending on what it is, you can frame it different ways. But when we talk about diversity in terms of how it applies in the workplace, where the real value is, we're talking about the promotion of differences. We're talking about highlighting and saying, I have these skills, there are these things about me that make me different, that make me special. We all have these things. So how do we promote that? How do we get to the core of why this is important, why we care about diversity? Diversity is a very big topic in our society, from a legal standpoint, from a business standpoint, from a scientific standpoint. Now, the way I like to talk about diversity in my classes in psychology is it's more than skin deep, right? Diversity is not just the color of our skin, our gender, where we come from, right? It's more than that. So most of the research, at least in the I.O. literature, focuses on the informational diversity and social diversity. The diversity in what do you know? What skills do you have? What makes you unique? The idea being the problem solving skills that you have, your ability to think creatively. Right? These things that are differences in the way you solve problems, the information you have, and then those societal differences, social differences, and perspectives and opinions. We'll talk about it a little bit later, but teams are, are very important in today's society in the workplace. They're important because they add adaptability to organizations, and they work because you take people that are different you put them together, and when they put their heads together, they have different ways of thinking, they can make the organization better. Higher ability of success. If you put four people together that think the same way, you've got four people that think the same way. In fact, you have copies. You put four people together that think differently, you have adaptability to different situations. That's where the real power comes from in diversity. Now, we know from the literature that diversity does a lot of good things. So diversity for organizations, organizations that promote diversity and have diversity are better with innovation, coming up with new products, they're better with creative ways of thinking, they're more adaptable, they can better survive changes in the markets, and they're better financial performance. So you think of companies like Google, you think of HP, you think of IBM, companies that have really strong diversity programs, this inner diversity, informational diversity, they do well. Right? They're companies you recognize because they're doing something special. Now we also know that with diversity, there, in the research, there are some negatives. Some people report less satisfaction in the workplace and less commitment to their job. Why is that? The idea being that it's part of a connection issue. Right? Diversity is all about learning of, uh, different people, learning the different skills, getting to know people, being uncomfortable. And everybody likes to do that. It can be difficult. So it's this difficulty making a connection. So uh, as Ron was talking about earlier, in the hallway, going up to someone you don't know and saying, hello, I'm so-and-so. How are you enjoying the conference? Right. I tell my students all the time in class, when I give them a break, what do they do? They pull out their phones and text people that are not in the room. <laughs> Talk to someone next to you. Meet someone new. They may be your new best friend. They may have an internship opportunity. You never know. Talk to people. Be uncomfortable. So these cultural competencies that I'm going to talk about are a way to get past that. So we want to become more satisfied. We want to become more comfortable getting out, stepping outside our shell, meeting new people. We need to highlight and focus and build these cultural competencies. Now, cultural competencies have many different names. There's multicultural competencies, uh, cultural adaptability. They're all really the same thing. That you have this skill set. You have something about you that you've developed over time that makes you better in diverse situations. So from an academic standpoint, a definition, there are many out there. One is that cultural competence is the process of developing cultural awareness, knowledge, and skills. Awareness of yourself. Where, what are your boundaries? What are your biases? What are your attitudes? Right? Understanding yourself. Getting knowledge of other cultures, the elements, the aspects. If you go to another uh, country, they may say hello differently. Just knowing that 
gives you some of these skills, gives you that competence. And then the skills to assess this cultural information, being able to go in and understand and be ready to learn, to see these differences, to say, okay, that, that is a good thing. I, I now know how to adapt to this situation. Now, for more practic practitioner definition, focusing on the practice side, we're focusing on an individual's ability to adapt to culturally diverse situations. It's one thing to say, yes, I have the awareness, I have the knowledge, but to put you in a situation that's uncomfortable and you can succeed. In a situation that you've never experienced before, but you have the skills to be confident, to go in and to succeed. To succeed in culturally diverse situations, to work with individuals that are dissimilar from yourself. To do something new, to do something different. So to be able to be successful, right? and this is something organizations are looking for, this adaptability, this uh, ability to go out and be diverse, to accept diversity, to promote diversity. Now, how do you get this? Right? Part of this cultural competence comes from exposure. Now, not passive exposure, right? active exposure. You can just go in a room, listen to someone talk, and you might learn something. But to go in and really become involved in the situation, to go in and really put yourself out there, to go in and be okay with failure, right? so you can use it as a learning experience. So actively going out there and getting exposure. Now, as psychology students, you have been exposed to some of these things. You just may not already know. You may not be thinking about how to sell them. Part of some goal, one of the things that as a professor in psychology, we don't do really well is telling you how to sell your skills. How you can go to a company and say, I can do this. Or I have experience with this. Cultural competencies is one of these things. So your courses are designed to teach you about differences. Right? Abnormal psychology, cross-cultural, industrial, developmental. They're all about how do you understand people? How do you develop this knowledge? How do you develop the skill set? General education courses, religious studies, art history. It's about learning something new. Right? I took a philosophy class in college. At the time, I thought it was really stupid. I'm like, why am I doing this? But after a while, I'm like, wait a minute. This teaches me how to make logical arguments. So I feel more comfortable with that. If you take art history, I don't know a lot about art history, but it showed me something I didn't know before. Right? It gave me something else I could rely on, more information. In your academic life, so study abroad. I take students on study abroad opportunities, and had never done it as a student, but to go and see a student that goes to a new country, doesn't speak the language, and they survive. And they're happy with surviving. They go two weeks and they make it home and say, I survived two weeks in Argentina. Right? They may have learned some about the culture, they learned about psychology, but they did it. Right? They said, I was able to go to a coffee shop, order coffee in a language I didn't speak, sit down, and try to discuss something with the locals. Right? That's unique. That's a unique skill. That's something that not everyone is willing to try. Being part of social clubs, organizations, so being part of German club. Right? You may not speak German well, but you're learning about differences. You're learning about how people think, how they interact, the model you in, any of these different activities where you can do something different. You're exposed to something. And again, not that passive exposure, active exposure. You're out there seeking it. Work experiences, jobs, internship, volunteer activities. Whenever you do these new things, they can be scary. You first day on a new job, it's scary. That's good. You're being challenged. You're going to adapt to it. You're going to succeed. That's part of it. Um, when students ask me about internships in I.O., they say, where can I get an internship? I say, go get a job. Go get a part-time job. Doesn't matter what it is. Go do something. And then be able to tell me what you learned from. Right? If you're a, a cashier at a grocery store, okay, it probably doesn't relate a lot to psychology unless you can convince me it does. Be able to go out there and say, I learned this. I learned how to interact with people. I developed some skill. I was able to succeed. So going and doing that meeting new people, developing relationships with coworkers. Those are things that are going to give you these cultural competency, these, these skills, the skill set. And then life in general. Family, friends, vacations, doing something different. Right? Making a new friend, going to an event where you don't know anyone, going out and networking. Those things can be scary. Right? They may not even be a lot of fun, but you can go do them and you can feel confident and feel more confident in, your, in yourself that you've done something special. You've done something unique. You've developed a skill. So as a psychology student, you've taken these classes, these academic things or, or academic life activities you do are building these skills. You just not, you may not be thinking about them in a particular way. So the really part I want to focus on here is, uh, important part is the six reasons why you and your employer should care. So when you go into an interview, when you're going to look for this internship, you can say, I have cultural competence. And they're going to say, tell me why. Tell me what this is. How can you do that? Just six simple ways that we can talk about cultural competence and why anyone should care about it. So the first is that the workplace is diverse. Whether you like it or not, 
the workplace is a diverse environment. It is necessary, unavoidable, and advantageous for organizations to be diverse for any job situation. Um, when I teach industrial organizational psychology, I always run the students say, well, I don't know why I should take this class because I'm going to be a clinician. I'm going to be a therapist. And I say, is that a job? And they say, yes. Then it is a workplace. You're going to, if you're running your own practice, you're going to have administrative assistants. You're going to have other people you're working with. So learning about how to deal with people, how to manage, how to be a leader, how to do these things is advantageous. And you will experience diversity. The global workforce. Multinational organizations are the norm. Your, your Walmarts, your Googles, your IBMs, all these organizations have branches, <coughs> locations in other parts of the world. They bring in people to work for these organizations from other parts of the world. And the more you're able to understand them, to understand your awareness, to be aware of your skill set, to understand what makes them unique, you can work with them better. The prominence of teams. So estimates are that more than 80% of organizations use teams. Why do organizations use teams? Because they're adaptable. Because they are useful in a lot of different situations. And Two heads are better than one. If you go in and you're able to take these people, create a team that's diverse, they have a unique skill set. They can do more. Right? They can build upon each other. They can be experts in different areas, but combine their knowledge and you have something really unique. So you're going to have to work with other people. So the better you're able to understand others to work with them, the better off you're going to be. Uh, the necessity of communication. Miscommunication is avoidable. It's going to happen in some instances, but the more you can understand other people, you can communicate with them. You can deal with them in difficult situations. You can work with them. You can compromise. Uh, global leadership and management. As I said, to understand and to work with individuals, to be a leader, you have to understand. You have to be able to make that, that leap. You have to be able to work with them. You have to understand what makes them tick. Right? What satisfies them? What makes them commit? What can you do and how can you learn more about them? And then lastly, personal growth and balance. Part of psychology, right, is learning more about yourself. How do we think? How do we feel? How do we understand others? So when you put yourself in a, a scary situation, when you're challenged, when you have adversity, you grow. So cultural competence is a skill set that you can grow through adversity, through doing something unique, through challenging yourself. So talking to someone, meeting someone, doing something unique, doing something you never thought you'd do, right? doing these things make you better, both as an individual and as an employee. So you always want to try to grow. You want to use these cultural competences, the skill set that is life. You really get it through living, through life. Uh, it's something that can help you, and it can help you get a job, and it's something that's going to help you be a better person. That's me. Do anyone have any questions for David? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> any questions? We're currently waiting, I guess not, we're okay. currently waiting for our handouts to uh, get here. Now, uh, let's see, a few things. First of all, if you want to stay, we hope to have them here, no guarantees that you know, it's a trucking company. Number two, uh, we're very happy that you came along, thank you for coming. Number three, we'll be for the next hour and plus. Actually, we still got plenty of time before we'll be, 30. Yeah, we'll be here, we'll have a few minutes before 1.20, I guess this one ends, we have yeah, 10 minutes, 10 minutes yeah. here uh, to take questions. Uh, and uh, also, if you'd like to get the uh, videotape of this, it should be on the Psychi website. Assume, let me know and I can get you the information. All the speakers here would be delighted to visit you at your college campus to do a program for your Psychi chapter, either as a group or as individuals. So please keep us in mind for that. We'd appreciate it. Uh, do you have questions for us, or do you want us to ask you questions? Ask us <laughs> questions. Anybody have questions for us for us? Yes? What do you recommend putting on your resume to show people, to get you in for the interview to a job? How do you tell the employer that you have to discuss? Who are you asking for us? <laughs> you right. Make sure your resume roars. Be sure it's results-oriented and relevant. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, you need to list each job, you know that, in the chronology at the bottom. Under that, put down what you really accomplished and what you did for, for the business in that job. Uh, do you want to give me an example of a job you've held? I can give you, or if not, I'll make one up. Well, I work, I work here. Okay, good. Perfect. I was going to use a cashier. Uh, how about a cashier at Dairy Queen? As a cashier at Dairy Queen, what could you possibly tell me? You could tell me that you cleaned the counters. You could tell me that you... Uh, counted the change and gave people the right change. 
You could tell me that he opened and locked the door. And that would be very boring and is all useless to put down. I know that by knowing you're a cashier. <coughs> okay, you know, right. Now, you could also tell me that you have an extremely high rate of return customers because they like your service. Right? You could tell me customers compliment you. You could tell me you take great pleasure in making things just custom for the little kids and they love you. Those are all the types of things you could tell me that would be very results oriented. You could tell me you won the Dairy Queen Salesperson of the Summer Award. So those are all different things. You could tell me that your colleagues like you. You could tell me you, you know, you've gotten promoted faster than other people. You could tell me you get more tips than the average. Making sense? Now, that's one thing you can do. That would be making yourself very results oriented. Now to make yourself relevant. At the top of a resume, you, you know, you have your name and address and all that stuff. Under that, some people would say this is not important. I would say it's critical. You need a statement. You could call it objectives. You could call it a summary. You could call it anything you want. I want two to three to four sentences or phrases that take all these uh, results at the bottom and totally tie them into the employer's needs. So if you wanted to become a salesperson for a company, you can show how all that experience ties and will help to make you the best salesperson for computer technology around, tied down with the computer science courses and all that stuff. Uh, does that make sense to answer the question? So make it results oriented and relevant. Okay. Uh, and do we have the, I see we have the refreshments. Do we have the handouts? No. No, they're supposed to appear at any, any time. One out of two isn't bad. Next question. <laughs> um, is there really a difference between a CV and a resume? And if there is, how do I turn my CV into a resume? Because I don't have any work experience other than working in the lab that I work in now. And I want to know how I can make a resume out of it without having half the thing blank. Do you want to talk about the CV and I'll talk about the resume? Sure. It's a, the CV is always is usually longer, right? You're talking more about the research side. It's usually going to start with the research and the education. So uh, it sounds like you have those experiences, right? You've worked in the lab, you've done those. But being a, a lab assistant, it's a type of a job, right? So it's something it's, I always see it as you're just switching it around. Whether it's a CV or resume, who you're giving it to, what do they care about most? Right? The CV, it's more of the academic side. It's the research, the education. For the resume, whatever work experience you have, whatever you've done. So work is what you've done. So if you've done things in a lab, you've done something. Right? So. And involvement in extracurricular volunteer activities. Number of organizations really think that's important. Number of organizations, by the way, will give time off to their employees to perform social services at one time. So if you have done volunteer work, if you've uh, been involved in various organizations, put that on there. Better to put it on there if you had a responsibility. Uh, by the time you're juniors, you should say, ask yourself, which organization do I want to belong to with the goal of becoming an officer my senior year? Anybody. Well, not anybody, but member, many of you can be in Psychi as a member. But you should be seeking office, you should be seeking responsibilities. Uh, employers will want to see not only that you've been in an organization, but what have you done. If you have done anything substantial, you've been involved with people at various levels. You've had to deal with faculty members and perhaps administrators. Uh, you've had to have a variety of experiences, and to the extent you were a leader, implied in that is that you've had a lot of interpersonal experiences. So be sure to include those in there. Now, uh, let's go back. First of all, a resume does contain that you went to school and all that kind of stuff. A uh, grade point average, put it down if it's high. If it's not high, consider <laughs> not putting it down. Don't put down that you had a 4.0 grade point average junior year. Because you know what that causes me to do, and I see this a lot of resumes. It causes me to say, how about freshman? You know, that wasn't too good. I was sick. I got it. Sophomore. Well, what about senior? Senioritis? No, that doesn't count. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but maybe uh, even if you had a somewhat weak year, you put down side high. That tells me something. Or something like that. Without being precise, make yourself look as good as you possibly can. Now, uh, what did you accomplish is what I want to know as, I mean, from the industry side. First of all, resume is typically shorter. Uh, how long should a resume be? That's an interesting answer. Somebody's been giving you propaganda that I don't buy. Uh, <laughs> uh, anybody have a different answer? I think it can be two. It can be as long as usually two pages. Uh, I, well, as long as what? As long as it contains all the information that. I'm I mean, liking it now. I, I like that point a lot. <laughs> don't give me an answer of a number. I like your answer a lot. What's your name? Cindy. 
Cindy, I like Cindy's answer. You wanted the resume to contain all the necessary information. Now, what is necessary to have on a resume? To get the person to call you for an interview. That's your objective and the sole objective of your resume. It's a sales pitch. It's not a life history. So as long as each phrase causes the person to be more likely to want to call you, for, uh, you should have it. I don't care if it's 50 pages. Now, if your resume is 50 pages, I kind of wonder what kind of miracle worker you are. <laughs> Remember, uh, all Barack Obama has to say, or Bill Clinton is President of the United States. All the rest is said. But what you can list is, what did you accomplish in the lab? Uh, you know, we publish studies in prestigious journals. And then, yeah, if you do that, by the way, have a reference section at the bottom. Uh, two papers at uh, prestigious conferences. Uh, you could put down uh, most productive research assistant in the department. Okay? You could put down that you, uh, a, a very quick summary of your findings. You know, uh, cured cancer. <laughs> uh, whatever it is that, that you happen to do. Uh, found uh, an alternative method for teaching reading. You tutored a, a student, fine. Students' uh, grade point average improved in first grade, whatever, from C to A. Whatever it is, look for those one-liners that really show what you've accomplished, that you're you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Next question. Do you think summarizing your findings and whatever research you did was relevant for a different type of job? Is that relevant for all types of jobs, do you think? It depends. All types, nothing's relevant for everything. Uh, there's always an exception, but should you summarize your findings? Perhaps so. Cure cancer is a very good summary. Yeah. Uh, right? Uh, and at that level, though, I think that it makes perfect sense. Do you recommend Do, like, tailoring your resume depending on what job you're doing? Oh, yes. Uh, the, yes. Yeah, every yeah. resume should be unique. Unless you're going to a job fair or something like that, in which case you really don't know exactly who you'd be meeting, in which case you probably should have several different versions of your resume so you can closely match it and have them somehow coded so it doesn't look to the interviewer like your point out <laughs> no, the right one. But somehow code it. You know, one maybe you have your uh, name at the top in capital all capital letters and the other one it's in bold face. A way you can quickly identify without being obvious what you're pulling out uh, there. But absolutely you should customize it and uh, you know have fun doing it. But yes you do want to show your findings at, in a way that the person that's reading it will understand them. If you put a lot of P's and F's down, you'll lose them. <laughs> guaranteed. Uh, but something general. You know, I came up with an alternative way to uh, reduce dementia. I studied dementia and uh, you know, found a very promising blah, blah, blah. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Next. Um, how much you recommend putting like, Greek life into resumes? Oh, that's a tough one. It depends, again, what you did. You know, you're going to have people that turn around and say, oh, uh, Greek life is this hazy. They're going to be there. And in some cases, it's probably not inaccurate. In other cases, it probably is very inaccurate. It all depends if you'll get, you know, whatever, the web. Now, what did you do with your Greek life? It would be the question I'd ask you. That you remember alone, I would not put necessarily put down or emphasize. In the same way, I probably wouldn't put down psychiatry if I did nothing for it. The question is, what did you do? You know, but you organized the tutoring for the local elementary school, and you found 15 tutors. You organized the blood drive, and you had the most successful blood drive on campus. You know, absolutely, you should put down the stuff that you accomplished. That you doubled the membership while you were the membership chair, <coughs> whatever it is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Treat it like a job. Treat everything like a job, basically. Okay. Yes? Um, question for you. Um, how would you incorporate cultural competence? Into the resume is a little more difficult. You're, you're going to have those experiences. It, it's more of a, if there's, you have a spot for skill sets or things, you could throw that in there. But it's not going to be something that they're maybe automatically going to know what it is. They may ask you the question. Right, so a resume is like anything else. Sometimes you want to stack the deck. You want to put something in there that's going to make them ask you a question. And then you can sell it. So a lot of that cultural competence is being able to explain what, what it is, being able to explain the skill. So if you have a section for um, people have it for computer skills, you know, but if you have something that says, uh, have this skill set, put in cultural competence. Or when you have that you studied abroad, or you were an officer yes. in a club, or you did these things, that's going to generate questions. Then you can discuss it. So it's not, it doesn't always fit as well into a resume. But if you can get that interview, you can get face to face, and you can explain it well, it really shows your competence in that. Uh, we've talked a lot about the resume. Nobody has asked me about the famous cover letter yet. <laughs> no one's asked you about the cover letter either. Uh, 
first of all, think of it as a letter of application with a resume attached. It's not a cover letter. It's your sales pitch. Again, you've got to get whoever's reading this to say what. Well, and realize they may not. There are some companies that just throw them away. But, or, or file them, whatever. But the key thing there is for you to interest people in you and in looking at your resume. I do want to take a couple seconds, just since the handout's on here, to show you what else you may request from us, because I don't think they're going to get here before some of the people leave. And, uh, uh, oh, I just not here? No, no. Um, let me let me mention a couple. First of all, and this is a shameless plug for a book, the questions regarding resumes and uh, cover letters, uh, Eric Landrum and I have dealt with in a chapter or more of our book called Undergraduate Degree in Psychology, uh, from college to career. If any of you are interested, I'm not going to pass it out. That would be shameless. But you can get a 30% discount if anyone's interested. And everything they're saying is correct, we can add more to it. And you're going to give them an extra 10% if they buy today. I can't do that as an, if, I were the, if I were the publisher, yes. Now, one more thing, too, uh, on that. Can you pull back the references one? Chan and Gardner. We've talked about jobs with the degrees. Now, I'm going to distribute something else to you. There may or may not be enough copies. But when we talk about the business or degrees in the business world, Ron has focused a lot on human engineering. But in this report by Chan and Gardner is, is really good for you as students, but also faculty. They have a lot of interesting graphs in terms of what attitudes the employers are looking for at the time of the interview, what sort of skills they're looking for, and they identify the kinds of jobs that liberal arts graduates get assigned to now. This is a report on the liberal arts in general, not just psychology. Uh, what they, what they have found out of uh, diverse organizations, survey of diverse organizations, these are the kinds of jobs that liberal arts graduates can get assigned to, uh, varying from 20% of the jobs to 40%. Administrative services, customer services, business services. That doesn't sound very enticing, very romantic or anything, but they do point out that these are the kinds of positions which require skills that liberal arts graduates have. These are the jobs that require people who can quickly grasp the organization as a whole, pull together diverse information, making it meaningful to upper management, quickly solve problems. This is what your liberal arts education is preparing you to do. Now, other jobs that you could be assigned to, marketing. Uh, take a course in marketing. It's very much psychology-based. Media and communication, very exciting area to get into. There's a lot that site can do in that area as far as I'm concerned. Uh, information management, human resources, computer services. These are typical kinds of jobs that liberal arts graduates get assigned to. And maybe that first job that you get may not excite you, but to the extent you find yourself using your problem-solving, critical thinking skills in this kind of area, uh, again, these are the jobs that lead to advancement. So when someone says you can't do anything with your bachelor's degree, these are the kinds of jobs you can expect in a number of industries. But read the whole report because they talk about different kinds of organizations. They break it down, those organizations that hire the larger number of, of uh, liberal arts grads, those that are more technical that hire the least the number. They talk about the appropriate attitudes that you need and so on. It's a very good report. It's, it's not, uh, well, it is, it is from SERI, the Collegiate Employment Research Institute. Uh, but that's one of the many good reports they have. But these are the kinds of jobs that you can expect to get with a bachelor's degree. And the reference section contains a lot of things that you might want to read, as yep. well as our recommended readings section. Yes. Now, not in there, but what's not a bad idea is to find a book from a business school on how to become a professional interviewer. Read that. Read all those little tricks of the trade that they want, or you can find it in I.O. Psych, and then you're going to be the best person to interview around, right, because you know all the tricks of the trade. You know, study all the business tests that they give, right, and so forth. Learn how to administer them. Learn how to interpret them. Then if you ever have to take them, you're going to do very well. Look at all the things you can do. These are, these are just some more charts that will be very interesting for you, I think. Uh, and then you, we concluded with, hey, we have egos, too. Uh, or at least I did, and I insisted that we put in our own bios there. Uh, we thank you very much for coming by. This session is formally over. We have about a three to four minute break while they bring the refreshments in. I hope everybody will stay. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Everybody.
Thank you very much.